Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Produce Buzzers Podcast. We are so happy you have joined us today, and I think you will be too after the show is over, because you will learn a lot about fresh fruits and vegetables, how to select and store them, how to prepare and cook them, and surprising facts about their history and origin. We hope it inspires you to eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, not only for your health, but also for your delight and pleasure as you explore their amazing world of taste and delicious flavors. Eating more of them will transform your life in so many positive ways. So settle back, relax, and get ready for another delicious adventure with the Produce Buzzers. Greetings and welcome to another delicious episode of the Produce Buzzers podcast. I'm Edwin Stepp, your host and executive editor of ProduceBuzz.com. I'm joined once again by Teresa Nolan, the founder and president of Produce Buzz, along with Rick Stepp and Cynthia Benedetto, both contributing editors to Produce Buzz. Now, Produce Buzzers podcast fans, I'm sure many, if not most of you, have grown up knowing and consuming delicious grape-flavored products made by Welch's. Grape juice, jams, and jellies, along with a whole line of other fruit-based products. But did you know that you can also get delicious fresh fruit products from Welch's? That's right, you can. And today we have a man who knows all about them. Andy Campa is General Manager of Sourcing for C.H. Robinson, a global fresh produce distribution company based near Minneapolis, Minnesota. Also known as Robinson Fresh, they have the license to package and distribute fresh fruit under the Welch's brand. And Andy is charged with making sure those products live up to the standards of Welch's many decades of superior quality. Andy has a unique perspective on the produce industry, stemming from his involvement on both the supply and commercial side of the supply chain. He specializes in South American deciduous fruits as he leads a team that imports grapes, blueberries, apples, stone fruit, cherries, pears, and citrus, connecting growers and customers on a global basis. We're going to learn more about all that from Andy in just a minute, but first I want to give a little bit of the history of the Welch's because it does indeed go back many years. In fact, over 150 years. In 1869, Thomas Bramwell Welch and his son launched the company in Vineland, New Jersey. Welch was a teetotaler. That is, he opposed the drinking of alcohol. He moved to Vineland because that town had been established as a temperance town in 1861. These towns were communities of people who were at the forefront of the temperance movement in the late 19th century. Vineland had been established by a Philadelphia real estate developer named Charles Landis. When he started the plans for it, Landis declared that he was about to build a city and an agriculture and fruit growing colony around it. The population reached 5,500 by 1865, and Landis determined the potential in growing grapes and named the settlement Vineland. He advertised to attract Italian grape growers to Vineland and offering them land to do that. Welch was a dentist, and he is credited with inventing a method of pasteurizing grape juice so it would not ferment. Thus was born Welch's grape juice, although at first he called it Dr. Welch's unfermented wine. <laughs> <laughs> and in 1893, he renamed it Welch's grape juice. Years later, he would add grape jam and jelly to his product lines. They would eventually package it into jars, which could be used as drinking glasses after the jam and jelly was consumed. <laughs> Rick and Teresa, I seem to remember that our kitchen cabinets were filled with those glasses. I don't oh, think, yes, definitely. I don't think our mom ever bought a set of glasses at the store. Oh, I love those jelly jars. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I wonder how many people mixed a few stiff cocktails in those glasses after those long days at work. <laughs> Dr. Welch probably turned over in his grave when that happened. <laughs> In 1956, the company was sold to the National Grape Cooperative Association, a cooperative of family-owned grape vineyards from New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Michigan, Ohio, and Ontario, Canada. They grow primarily Concord and Niagara variety grapes. 
In the 1960s, Welch's became a major sponsor for the primetime cartoon, The Flintstones. And the characters in the show eagerly consumed Welch's grape juice in various scenes. They also featured the, the characters in the commercials for Welch's. It was Little Pebbles Flintstones' favorite treat. <laughs> <laughs> now, the National uh, Grape uh, Cooperative Association still owns Welch's, and they are now licensing their brand to fresh fruit growers through Robinson Fresh. And you can find Welch's grapes, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, and even cranberries in your local supermarket. And you can be assured that the quality lives up to the Welch's standard of excellent. And that's primarily because of the man we have on the show today. We're delighted to have Andy Campa on the show to tell us about these delicious fruits and everything you need to know about them. Welcome to the show, Andy. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for the history lesson also. I just learned more than I ever knew. And <laughs> on top of it, you know, the Welch's brand is is so global that you did forget to mention even Notorious B.I.G. Oh. includes it as one of his rap songs. So, I mean, oh. it's, it's not just for kids also. That's great. Yeah. I didn't know that. It's a, it's a pretty awesome brand in the sense that it's so widely known and certainly uh, one that is so accepted amongst m a multitude of generations and Right. and demographics so we're really lucky and proud to be able to represent it on the fresh side of the business yeah that's great yeah that is definitely true that's interesting about the rap. yeah you can probably tell i'm not one who's i don't i hate rap but i'm not one that's into it much so i would not have known that without knowing that i wouldn't have known it until i started selling welch's grapes and then it caught my ear one day <laughs> there you go it was pretty cool he's talking about the welch's juice yeah, well, let's help. Hopefully, that's helping with your marketing as well. Okay, we're going to learn a little bit more about Welch's and Robinson, but I want to know more about. First, I want to know more about Andy Campa. What's your background? How did you get into the fresh produce business? Well, I, I come to the business in a weird manner. When I was growing up, my parents kind of had three things they wanted my sisters and myself to do, and me being the youngest, I got stuck with the third thing. So they said you should either be in medicine, <laughs> education, or food and beverage. I'm not okay. sure why they said that, because one of my grandfathers was a vice president of an insurance company. And now after 20 years of being in the industry, it seems like that might have been a little bit easier. But uh, here <laughs> I am. I've got a sister who's a doctor, a sister who's a teacher. And I, I got into the, the food and beverage industry, as you'd call it that. My grandfather on my dad's side at one point owned a grocery store oh. and uh, was always kind of fascinated by it. And an uncle on that side still works in the grocery business. So... Uh, my dad was in pharmaceuticals, and I knew I didn't really want to get into that because I saw how he was always um, kind of gone, and his he, he was never headquartered in the state that we lived in. So my goal, I went to Gustavus Adolphus College. It's a small liberal private you know, school down in St. Peter, Minnesota, and they had a private school's job for And I remember, remember going and telling myself, whatever I do, wherever I land, I want it to be headquartered in Minnesota. That's where I'm from. That's where my family's from. And so I focused on companies like Target, Cargill, Honeywell, places like that that were all based here. And somehow, some way, I got an interview with C.H. Robinson. And so I went, and that was pretty cool. And they suggested I go interview with this group called CPDS. It was Corporate Procurement Distribution Services. And I went around <laughs> the room. I don't know. It felt like four or five different times on different days and they didn't give me the job and I was heartbroken, but there was a small group also in Eden Prairie, Minnesota called local sales. And they referred me over there. And quite honestly, it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Mm. I was hired on by a smaller group that really had a desire to train me. My first day I thought I was coming to do transportation and they told me I was selling citrus and I thought, oh, what? <laughs> uh, but my first order ever was, uh, to Westcott down in Elgin, Minnesota, to a gentleman named Orv Weir. I sold him a certain brand of Valencia's. He called, told me never to do that again, and he asked <laughs> me to come down so he could show me why. And that was my indoctrination into the produce industry. So uh. <laughs> pretty quickly, I learned the ropes of the produce industry. Uh, started in citrus, as I said, but it was pretty cool when I got hired because we were smaller. We had an office in Eden Prairie, Omaha, and Kansas City at the time, they let me be a little bit of a chameleon at, at first. So I did the citrus thing and then I did West to Midwest transportation. So I got to figure out that side of the business. And then they gave me Western veg. Western veg was not my favorite thing. <laughs> After I had been selling 
you know, whatever it was, 7,200 boxes of clementines in a, a truckload. And I had to sell all the little one-off spring mixes and everything case oh, yeah. by case. Like, this <laughs> not for me. But I stuck to it and I did pretty well with it and grew our customer base on the Western veg piece into the Midwest. And then they came to me one day and said, we need you to run our import grape program for the local sales team. And I said, how do I do that? And they said, you'll figure it out. <laughs> so thankfully I had a great mentor and Terry Trifles, who to this day, people kid the first probably two years I worked there, everything, every email, every comment that came out was Andy and I, Terry and I, Andy and I, because he brought me everywhere. Yeah. And it, we actually, they made shirts at the office. They're pink and it's Terry and myself and it says Andy and I. And Terry and I. Uh, <laughs> but it was a great way to really uh, cut my teeth in the import game. And then from there over the years, you know, I've been a part of our stone fruit program, cherry program, apple pear, uh, program, strawberry program. But really grapes has been the one that I've stuck, stuck to for the better part of the last 20 years. And with that came the branded program of Welch's. Yeah. Now, just a quick bit of history there. Um, there was a very bright mind that was at Robinson before me. And he had the idea around branding these big national brands with produce. So don't forget, at one point we had Mott's, we had Tropicana, and we had Welch's, arguably the three biggest juice brands in, in North America at the time. So, so, so Robin Robinson had all three of those brands yes. marketing into that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, the one that we still focus on today is Welch's. It's been the most prominent for us and the one we've really been able to build out from a global perspective, from a supply base where we can have it year round and service our customers. Yeah. But uh, very proud to be the steward of that over the last 20 years, working with Welch's corporate throughout that time, our marketing department and theirs has, lended me some awesome insight into the world of how you sell produce in a brand manner and yeah. how you take advantage of that. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today. I'm happy to share and thank yeah. you all for ha having well, me. Well, that, uh, you know, that's the thing about the branded produce. Uh, uh, you know, as I said, a lot, most of our listeners are consumers of produce, not in the industry and branding produce is not an easy task, uh, you know, because it's not widgets. They don't. We, we try to educate our consumers on the challenges that growers and shippers, packers face so they can understand more about what they're seeing on the produce shelves. And we try to emphasize that, look, it's not a widget. You know, they're at the mercy of Mother Nature. And uh, but yet there are some very good brands out there who make sure that the quality is consistent. And I think you guys have done that. So I do want to hear more about those challenges. So, uh, so we'll get in that. So now we said a little bit about CH Robinson and uh, Robinson fresh, but is there any, can you give us any more insight and maybe into the history? You said it's over a hundred years old. I think you said. Yeah, absolutely. So we started in 1905. So just a little while ago uh, in Grand Forks, <laughs> North Dakota, we we started off being what I would just call a produce brokerage house yeah. and quickly learned that you need to be able to get things from point A to point B. And so that morphed into this early onset of the transportation side of our business, which now today is the largest third party logistics company in the world. Oh, wow. uh, but we had a little bit of a jump on the deregulation of transportation. Uh, the Motor Carrier Act that happened in 1979 or 1980 you know, deregulate, deregulated the ability to trans, uh, have transportation services. So we were a little bit ahead of that because produce was kind of exempt from that. So we had already started working on building a, a carrier base and understanding how to get things from point A to point B. So I've had this luxury of not only working for one of the largest produce companies in the world, but our parent company is also one of the largest third-party logistics companies of the world yeah. in the world. And with so fresh produce, them. such a perishable product, those logistics are even much more key. As I said, they're not widgets. You've got to not only are they mercy of Mother Nature and the growing of it, but getting it from point A to point B, as you said. So, And having visibility. That, right. That's the biggest thing. So when we're growing grapes, per se, in Brazil, Peru, Chile, Mexico, the United States, or South Africa, we do a pretty good job of keeping a handle not only on the quality, but also the visibility of the supply chain, trying to make sure that we're driving out costs, but also adding efficiencies in that supply chain yeah. to be able to give our customer greater insight as to when product's going to be there, how it will arrive, all of those things. So that the 
the joint venture, if you'd want to call it that, between C.H. Robinson and Robinson Fresh certainly is a pretty awesome one. And I would tell you when I started, not that it's like a, um, a date of entry that's prominent, but in July 7th, 2003, we were 2,500 employees. Today, as a as an overarching enterprise, we're around seventeen thousand employees. Wow. wow! So I've really had an opportunity to see the company change, grow, mature, become more professional, and certainly establish themselves in the world as a, a true dominant uh, logistics provider and service platform. Yeah. Andy, with you guys doing the distribution, are your drivers employees? No. I think last I looked from a transportation perspective, but I believe we have 96,000 active contract carriers. Uh, some, and we do somewhere around 20 million shipments annually to 100,000 different customers. Wow. So in order to have that kind of network of carriers, we, we partner with some of the, the biggest, the best, all the way down to some of the independently owned and operated carriers to make that happen. When you talk about the deregulation now, when the pendulums swung back the other way, when I worked on Hunts Point Market a million years ago, the drivers that would come in and the teams that would bring product from California to New York, maybe three days, I always make the analogy that they were like the last cowboys. They could certainly get from point A to point B and the common sense was staggering. But now with I guess GPS is the biggest culprit in terms of how much time you can have on the road. How has that affected things? So I guess I look at it maybe from a little bit different lens than most because we're a publicly traded company. I think it's the best thing that could have happened in our industry to regulate hours of drivers and, and honestly regulate the idea of I can go a little bit further. I should go a little bit further. And then you add that level of danger element into it when you have 80,000 pounds rolling down the road. Um, as a dad of three, I'm thankful that the regulations came into place. I'm thankful that we do have some restrictions to make sure that the people behind the wheel are not only safe for themselves, but those around it. And I think that customers in general have adapted nicely to it. You know, the, the days of getting the, uh, the cowboy driving, as you said, driving from California to the Hunts Point market and somehow without a spaceship getting there in three or four days, is you know, those days are over. <laughs> right. And, and that's OK, because you do have to plan in our industry. And uh, I think that we do a nice job of that. The one thing I would say around in that same vein is just the simple fact that I believe that personally, I believe that Robinson Fresh has some of the greatest tracking capabilities and ability to alert our customers and even carriers for different issues that can arise along their route. And so I'm very proud of the fact that you know we continue to develop our technology to be best in class in that space. And I think from a, a global perspective, being able to have visibility of shipments is so critical based on the fact that everything seems like it's just in time now. Um, yeah. And so so I like it personally. Well, that's what it's all about, adapting. And again, uh, I mentioned that we wanted to talk about some of those challenges of getting uh, fresh produce, highly perishable in some instances, you know, really perishable. You talk about Western veg. When he said that, I thought, well, those are the things that really can decline fast. But tell us about the challenges of getting speed. product from A to B. Uh, yeah, in the speed fresh to produce. market is incredibly important for us. Um, I would say the thing that makes Robinson Fresh very unique is a person like me might have a, a vision for a category and I can provide a business plan to my bosses. And in general, if it makes sense, we're willing to implement it. And why do I tell you that? I go back to when I first started at Robinson and I was trying to understand our import program and how it worked and how we advanced money to growers and how we paid ocean freight and how we made sure that the advancements on ocean freight and advancements to growers weren't for not, meaning we weren't getting terrible product when it got here. At that time, we had a gentleman named Daniel Lagunas who lived in Chile and worked on Robinson Fresh's behalf. And he was our single handed, um, he single handedly, I should say, managed our quality control at source. Daniel was a legend in the industry. He was a gentleman who taught me more about the importation of fruit for sure from South America than maybe anybody in the industry. Unfortunately, he passed away about five and a half, six years ago. 
Hmm. And I could tell you during that time when Daniel had passed away and we needed to make sure that we still ensured the quality at location, we not only doubled down, we tripled down on that. And so Hmm. now we have our own team in Peru, in Brazil, in Chile, consultant in South Africa, all in the vein of trying to make sure that what gets on that ship arrives in the manner that we need it to so we can service our customers in the manner that they want it. The the wild thing about what you're asking is to to have a branded program 365 days a year takes an extreme coordination. Oftentimes, I go into a retailer and they say, well, you don't own the land. And I said, you're right. I don't want to own the land. Robinson, Fresh, C.H. Robinson has the capital to go buy a vineyard here and there, but we don't have the capital nor the bandwidth to have our own vineyards in six different countries, which is what we use just to provide Welch's grapes into North America. We don't have the capability within each country to have anywhere from six to 12 different ranches in different parts of each one of those. Each one of those. We do have the wherewithal and the connections to have some of those above ground input contacts and investments and then input our own people into country to make sure that things get executed properly. That's really the only way you can do it. Because as you said earlier, like the brand is so widely known for the juices, the jams, the fruit snacks, the jellies, all those things that never change. They don't deviate. It's sort of like a McDonald's uh, cheeseburger, right? You could have it anywhere in the world and essentially taste the same. Well, in fruits and in fruits and vegetables alike, that's nearly impossible because we have different varieties. We have different growing conditions. We have different root stocks on the vines themselves. We have a different way of doing things from, from farm to farm to ranch to ranch, whatever you want to call it. And so yeah. you have to have an ability to standardize it in some way. And so what we do within the Welch's brand, whether that's on grapes, on stone fruit, on blueberries, or even on apples, those, that's the brand extension in the fresh side of the business that we've been able to get to. We do have a very rigid set of standards that the grower needs to adhere to to right. make sure that we get that consistency because we know through some of the analytic data that we we gather, if we give a consumer a bad experience and it's associated with their brand, it's going to take them a long time to come back. And we don't yeah. want to do that. Not, I mean, you mentioned Welch's is older than Robinson Fresh, right? We're 1905. I think you said they're 1869 or somewhere in there. Right. That's right. Those are two historic brands. And so yeah. quality control for us is extremely important throughout all countries, all seasons, all the time. Do we get it perfect every time? No. Do we try our best to do it? And have we learned a lot over the years of being the steward of the brand? Absolutely. And so if you would look at what we do from a, whether it's domestic or import or wherever it is, we check, recheck, check again, and make sure that we're adhering to the customer's demand more so than saying, here's what we have and you're going to own it. And I think that's the coolest part about it. So when we have consumers that are emailing us or calling, we have a, we have a live person that will answer the number on the side of our bag all the time and ask, where can I get more of this? Where can I, it, that's pretty cool because yeah. they understand that, you know, some of the work that our team does is paying off. And I really appreciate that when those, when those calls come in. Yeah, that's got to be very rewarding. Proud of that. But yes, we've had many consumer facing brands over the years. And as I said, you know, Welch's is to me our most prominent one. And there's a reason for it. You know, Mm -hmm. we talked about some of the the normal items. But if you were to go into a just a traditional grocery store, there might be over 35 different SKUs of Welch's in there. People don't think about that. Right. The one that blows my mind is the frozen avocados. I don't have an association with Welch's there, but people love the brand, right? Uh, But there's so many different items, and we're so fortunate. And this is a cool part about being tied to C.H. Robinson. We've got an unbelievable marketing department, an unbelievable analytics department. So what we can do is when we go in and we're trying to sell and help a customer grow their category, we can talk about taking a center store item, and if a retailer – If you ever go to a grocery store, folks, as you're listening and you get coupons that spit out to you after you get your receipt, that's in general called the Catalina system. Hmm. What the Catalina system does is the Catalina system analyzes what you buy and then it spits out coupons in an effort to either have you buy like items or different items. So a good example of the Catalina system working in our favor is when we're trying to transition a consumer from buying the center store, getting them into the produce department. And not taking away from that center store, 
But when we see they're purchasing one of the 30 some other Welch's products in the store, it can alert a coupon to spit out to give them 50 cents a dollar off their next pound of Welch's grapes. And so the idea is to take that consumer who already knows and recognizes the brand and drive them back into the fresh section of the grocery store in an effort to show them that we also have this fresh side of the business in a great brand that they know and trust that can that not only uh, they can know and trust, but also the kids gravitate toward. As mm -hmm. I had already said, we have three boys here and whenever we're changing packaging or thinking of a new theme, I always show them and ask, would you buy it? Like, right. Yeah, we'd buy it. Or no, they wouldn't. And if they say no, then, then that, that's that, right? <laughs> that's the authority. Of, yeah. It, it's kind of like when I used to have a magic eight ball at my desk and say, <laughs> now, uh, but, but the idea is to appeal, not to appeal, not only to the purchaser, but oftentimes when people are in the grocery store or even shopping online now, they do recognize brands or their child recognizes something that they like and they'll ask for it. Mm -hmm. And so we're very fortunate in the sense that, you know, we get some free marketing to be honest with people walking up and down the aisle. Uh, but we do everything we can in the fresh space to also complement that. That's great. Okay. Listeners, you heard it. Don't leave those coupons behind. Look at them, check them out. You're going to get some yeah, really look. good grapes and berries. If you get one of those, if you hit it big and it spits out a coupon for Welch's, so, okay, well, let's go to Welch's. What what do you label? What fruits and fruits do you label under the Welch's brand? Sure. I think the most known one is grapes, right? That's the one that we sell the most of. Makes the, the most, most sense, prominent. too, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, I think if, you know, you ask, you know, the polling that we do, it's, it's certainly the most recognizable brand in all of grapes. Uh, we did a third-party survey with a company called Zappi a few years back, and we... Uh, reestablished the fact that that was fact, right? Um, <laughs> there is another brand that came into the marketplace touting it. And so, you know, we wanted to make sure that we knew how we sat in the marketplace. And with the Welch's uh, brand itself being the most recognized brand for juice and jelly, we want to be that way on grapes also. So what do we do? How do we utilize it? Well, we utilize it within the grape space for sure. But as we had that brand extension, like I was telling you about, we were thinking to ourselves, how cool would it be if a consumer could come into a produce section and see not only Welch's grapes, but blueberries and strawberries alike? Right. And the reason that that was important to us is because we feel that, that the berry category holistically can sell together. We think that the purchaser that is typically buying grapes is also probably looking at strawberries and blueberries. And so to have that brand extension and keep that clean in the produce section from an eye appeal for the consumer is a pretty awesome thing for us. Yeah. Now, we also have very heavy penetration and extreme customer loyalty in Puerto Rico, if you believe it or not. Oh, wow. That's Puerto Rico is a, a great hotbed for us and with Welch's. If there's anybody from Puerto Rico listening, thank you very much for your support. But we've also <laughs> we do have a few. <laughs> yeah, we've also extended the brand line into apples down there. Oh. And that's been a nice win. Because if you do look in the juice section, you see a variation of, you know, different flavors within Welch's. Right. As a matter of fact, side note, um, I was once at Myron Mixon's Barbecue School in Unadilla, Georgia. I love, I love <laughs> Oh, of course. Who hasn't been there, Andy? Yeah, yeah, it, it, was, it, it, was an, it was an incredible experience in his own right. But all of a sudden, he started telling us how he's going to make this ham. And he was using white grape peach Welch's juice. And if you ever get online and you watch Myron Mixon do any sort of uh, cooking display, unsolicited, I've asked Welch's corporate, do you pay the most winningest man in barbecue to use your juice and tell everybody about it? And the answer is no. <laughs> and what and was the name of the juice? It's the it's the white, white grape. grape peach, I believe is what it is. I, yeah. I thought I heard two, two different fruits. And I was like, white. Yeah. And, and now that I say it, I omitted the fact that we also do stone fruit in Welch's. So our peaches, plums, nectarines, um, because that is part of their juice line. Yeah. But when he, again. And their the jams and jellies, their jams and jellies, they have almost every fruit flavor too, I think, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. But in my mind, if the most winningest man in barbecue is willing to unsolicitedly promote the brand, the, the product, it tells me that they have a great brand. They have yeah, a great product. Right. And so it forces me internally to point the thumbs once in a while and say, we have to raise our game too. 
to be on par with what they're doing on their side of the business so we can both continue to accelerate and grow. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So we can see that episode online somewhere, I suppose, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm talking about that. But you were actually there. I did. You actually, I, you I got visited. a chance to go to his home and Where? be a part of the barbecue school. Is it, do you I, say it's in Georgia? Unadilla, Georgia. Unadilla, <laughs> Georgia. Yeah. They've got some great names and towns in Georgia. Certainly do. <laughs> okay, so what uh, what kind of package options do you have under the Welch's brand for your different grapes and berries? Yeah. Well, we have anywhere from a one pound, two pound, three pound clamshell, single color, bi color. We have fixed weight bags. We have random weight bags. We have display ready cartons. We have um, bins. We have a number of different bins. things. <laughs> um, display ready bins. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Not bins of raspberries. Uh, no. 20 bushel. <laughs> yeah, that'd be wild and probably a pretty big uh, hazard. Big store, mess. But, uh, really, again, it's similar to what I was saying earlier. We have customers that will come to us and ask for something, and we're in the business of making it happen. Mm. You know, so right now, I'd say in the grape space, just speaking of grapes for a second, um, you know, your traditional format at any store would be a one pound, two pound, three pound or a bag, whether that's a fixed price or a fixed weight bag or a fixed or a non-fixed, you know, open random weight bag. So we have mm-hmm. all of that covered, but I'd say one of the unique things for us is we do, I wouldn't call it a monthly promotion, but certainly we have these uh, different promotions throughout the year, whether it's back to school, healthy, happy Halloween, mm-hmm. Mother's Day, Father's Day, uh, 4th of July, um, St. Patrick's Day, or even Valentine's Day. We yeah. really make an effort to get some excitement in the category and draw people into that fresh department. And, you know, part of where we win there too is the omni channel segment of it. You know, the, the brand is very prominent online, I would say, because people look at that, they view it as a value. They know that they can trust it. Mm -hmm. And so when we're promoting and doing different things online, we not only gain uh, consumers coming back into the store, but also consumers purchasing more frequently online. And so those are some of the outside things beyond just the packaging that we try and do. But as an extension of traditional grapes, we do have the candy line of grapes. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was going to ask about that. What tell yeah, us about? That. It's funny, you know. I I've been on record saying, "Is it so wrong to grow a grape that tastes like a grape?" But one of our grapes, <laughs> we say right on the package now, sweet strawberry flavor, or slight strawberry flavor. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's a unique uh, sense of that specialty line that certain consumers want it i would say the same you me, know you look, me i yeah, i am you. the consumer i i am the consumer <laughs> because you, you got so i think that in the past with the uh, with regular table grapes you it was hit or miss and it just was not as consistent and in terms of just uh the sweetness even if it was a little bit sweet it just it would just peak and valley and then the cotton candy came out then the this and that and that so i'm i am uh pretty set in my ways but if it's a new product uh pro, a, a new fruit that i think is going to be sweet i'm going to try it <laughs> yeah, i so think most weird. of our listeners are familiar with what we're talking about here but i should i should do this just remind me yeah there's new flavors of grapes being developed out there some of you listeners may not have come across them they have the flavor of cotton candy some of them have the flavor of uh i can't remember all the others they, they they've mimicked the flavor of the kind of candies you can get on the in the candy shelf and it's they're they're pretty close anyway so, so sorry what other, really what other, i think um, the general consumer doesn't always realize how many varieties of grapes there are oh, yeah, that's I, a good point. oftentimes yeah. when i ask somebody oh what's your favorite grape with all oh, the red ones right. <laughs> and, and i tell them well in california last year we grew somewhere around 100 different varieties and they're like what a yeah. hundred different table grape varieties and they all have their nuances some you know i've been around the industry for 20 years and I'd be hard pressed to figure out what's what on a few of them, but I think a lot of them do have some distinctive characteristics to them. And that's when it's cool. I'll never forget. Yeah. I was in a grocery store one day and I saw this guy, he's filling up his cart with a Timson grape. It was a Peruvian Timson. And I walked over to him and I said, Hey, do you mind me asking why you're buying so many of these grapes? And he looked at me like I had eight heads, right? <laughs> why is this guy asking me about grapes? I happen to ask a lot of people about grapes in the grocery store and it takes yeah. them off guard every time. Don't right. tell them I'm in the industry. 
but he said he had brought him to he brought him to work and he bought him at a, a local grocer here in Minnesota called Coburg's. This is in Ramsey, Minnesota. I happened to be up there for a hockey game with one of my kids. And he said, you know, where I work, there aren't any Coburns in the inner metro area. And I shared these grapes at work on Friday. And I had like five or six different people ask me if I could buy him a bag and bring him to work on Monday. <laughs> and I just thought that was such a cool thing because at that point, you know, most people just say it's a green grape. But there was a unique distinction around the flavor. Yeah. And that flavor spurned, you know, five different people to say, hey, go buy this for me. Right. So I've seen that a number of times, and that's always kind of been that thing in the back of my mind that drives our category. Like, hey, we have to have that uniqueness for sure, but we also have to have that consistency so we don't have the opposite effect. Right? Yeah. Oh, those are terrible. I'm not going to buy those. And I think that's the cool part about the candy variety because sometimes it gets people back into the candy line. It gets people back into the category that maybe at some point, like Cynthia's, oh, these are tart. They're terrible. It was a perlet from Mexico and, you know, May <laughs> – 20 years ago or whatever it was. Oh, and yeah. I would hate it when I get the seeds in the middle. Oh. Uh, I correct a lot of people when, I, when I'm when i shopping. I'm like, you know those have seeds in them? How'd you know? I, I know. <laughs> see, you see he, he would be no different down here because I end up saying that like I like end up like half stalking people like mm, no you, that, that's has got avocado and then they're like get this woman away from me. She's scaring me. <laughs> what other yeah, candy I, flavors do you have? My wife and I celebrate our 17th year of marriage tomorrow. Oh, and I would say for the better part of the last half of that, we don't grocery shop together because of that. Uh. <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to spend half my time in the produce department. I certainly don't want you talking to people about grapes. Uh, so. yeah, I know that story. Yeah, yeah. I think all yeah. of our spouses feel that way. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a question. What other candy varieties are there other than cotton candy? Candy Heart, the Candy Snap, the Candy Dream. The berry snap, and then obviously the cotton candy. There's a sweet carnival grown by Sunview yeah. Marketing. There's a number of different ones, and there's some newer ones. That moon grape? No, I don't really call that. I think that's more of a specialty grape because it doesn't have like real high flavor profile like some of the candy varieties. I think the candy varieties, my in my own opinion, have some element of a muscat flavor to them. So if you ever have a grape that you eat, in a store or at your home and it's kind of got a different finish to it. it meaning you know as you're done chewing it and you kind of taste that little note and that that's kind of that muscat in each one of those varieties i believe that's either more prominent or less prominent yeah. sometimes if you get a texture or you get a weird um, dryness yes 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 on your so, teeth or something yeah that that's when the, the fruit doesn't have a, a proper balance between sugar and acid we call that bricks in the grape industry right if it doesn't have a high enough bricks there's certain varieties like the scarlet royal as an example at one point the most planted red grape in california when growers first started to grow that traditionally you might pick a red seedless variety in california from 16 to 18 bricks well, that's where they're picking it and people were getting it at the store or at their home and their mouth was drying out and it was tannic almost and what that is, is the, the tannic acids in the skin not being fully uh, ripe, if you want to call it that, to have the sugar balancing out with some of the acid. And it gives you that kind of dry um, experience. But I think that now that growers fully understand how to grow many of these new age varieties, you see less and less of that. I will eat some before I buy it. And if it has any kind of weird flavor or if it's not sweet, I'm not buying it. We may have to bail Cynthia out of jail for doing that. So. <laughs> know, right? hey, hey, I'm in the same camp. You got to try grapes before you buy them. That's my opinion, yeah. too. Same thing. My wife's mortified. I'm handing them to the kids. She's like, can you do this? <laughs> yeah, free box if they want. What's the season for the candy grapes? Are the, Is it all year round or just certain times of the year? Fair question. I would say that they've propagated cotton candy to be grown in so many countries around the world now that we have cotton candies from Mexico, the United States, Spain, Brazil, Peru, Chile, and more that come to the United States. So I feel as though that one's year round. Some of the other ones are still growing in their, uh, in their state, meaning they're not quite big enough to be year round yet. I'd say predominantly we see California having the best production with the best 
consistency and flavor and speed to market, which I talked about earlier being an important factor, especially when you have high sugar content grapes like those, uh, you want to get them to the market quickly. Uh, so I would say, you know, that late July all the way into October is a great time for many of those. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, uh, uh, what, what can you tell our listeners the, out there to look for in 2024 for, from Welch's or Robinson Fresh? All right. Well, I, we have some exciting stuff on, on the cusp here. I would say for 2024, you know, we've partnered with some fabulous growers across all of the commodities we discussed, whether that's grapes, blueberries, strawberries, stone fruit, apples around the world to bring some of the very best varieties. I think what you'll see from us is a continued focus on the marketing aspect of it, you know, yeah. helping people understand not only uh, the, the, the benefit of the brand, but more importantly for us, that we, what we'd like to focus on is the health benefits of the fruit. Yeah, great. Well, I've been very, very fortunate to sit on a couple of different panels at uh, the last two global grape summits. Uh, one was in <laughs> London, one was in Bakersfield. Getting to go to London was a little cooler than going to Bakersfield, but uh, <laughs> either way, you know, we talk about all these new age varieties and we talk about the candy varieties. We talk about the high flavor profile varieties. One of the things that's very important to me within the industry is the health benefits of fruit and making sure that what we're providing for the consumer is something that they're, they're excited to give to their child that you know, is generally a healthier op, um, option. That's why if you ever look at our branded program during Halloween, we branded it as Happy Healthy Halloween. It's just That's brilliant. Thing. That's uh, I would share when we had Mott's apple slices, I gave those out at Halloween and I got teepeed that night. So maybe you know, it's <laughs> like you get out, uh, on Halloween, but I learned that one the hard way. Uh, but from, uh, you know, that, that, that consumer feedback was pretty uh we want candy uh, <laughs> you didn't give away the little craft caramel cubes <laughs> with it <laughs> i, I should have i went all healthy that year uh the, the big piece i think for robinson fresh moving into 2024 is we have outstanding leadership right now i think we're in we're driving in a great direction to provide services to our customers that really enhance the experience of the end user. And you might say, well, wait, we just talked for the last 45 minutes about, you know, buying and selling produce and getting it to market. And what we didn't talk about is how it goes to market, the analytics around how we provide correct pricing to entice the customer to yeah. purchase when and where. We didn't talk about the global suite of services that Robinson Fresh provides. So one thing that most consumers really don't know and probably don't even think much about they just say oh there were grapes on the shelf that there are there are apples on the shelf that there they weren't well we really focus on trying to be experts and expertise of scale and so what that means is when we go to a customer at a retailer let's call it we we're there not to just sell them a box of produce we're there to be very consultative uh, consultative rather we want to be able to show them the opportunities within the supply chain we want to be able to better their online presence, maybe even help them understand something around planograms in the store, store sets, replenishment. All of those things are things that Robinson Fresh offers in terms of our suite of services. That's totally different. The approach kind of um, enables us not only to help our customers navigate uh, through really complex global supply chains like you were alluding to earlier yeah. when we had... Um, all of the trouble in the Panama Canal and, and whatnot in 2000, 2001, but also to orchestrate very comprehensive integrated strategies that in this world that's constantly changing, we can navigate through that environment and still be successful to get the fruits and vegetables on the shelf for the consumer day in and day out when they want them. So in a very roundabout way of saying, I'm excited for 2024. I think the momentum that we are continuing to build in the marketplace is exciting. And I think some of the new uh, commodities, new countries of origin, and just the, the new go-to-market strategies for some retailers around the country that will go with them on will be exciting to consumers around the country. You know, it's a miracle what you guys do when I think about it. You know, you guys are, are, are getting food to us year round, delicious, nutritious, 
And man, the challenges you face, you, you know, you guys are all heroes, in my opinion. <laughs> I, I'm sure you've read recent articles lately, but the Panama Canal has a massive drought. And yes. that, that will be a very big challenge ahead of us. It's the primary route to North America from South America. So we're seeing yeah. shipping lines make decisions from Asia to come all the way around South America to the West Coast of the United States. Really? There's drastic things happening right now. Well, part of the issue right now in the Panama, just to give you a 30-second snippet, let's say a month ago, there were somewhere in the, the realm of over 30 booking appointments every day for ships to cross or ships to pass through. By, I believe, February 18th, if I'm remembering off the top of my head, they'll be down to 18 appointments a day. So mm. it's about half of the appointments. Now, the nice thing is most perishable shipments have appointments booked far out in, far out in advance. Uh, but that will change as we start to see more mass coming from Peru, Brazil, Chile, all at once. And I do think that we'll see some challenges. So let's all hope for some rain in Panama. One of the things they said has caused the drought is the El Nino this year. And it's interesting because it's very, been very dry in Florida for the same reason. It kept our hurricanes off the coast, but it plays havoc with our weather, including making it very rainy in some places and not rainy enough in others. I feel like the last five years, the weather has been way more unpredictable than the first 15 that I've been in the industry. Hmm. And it just it it is a challenge. You know, you talk about El Nino, the coast El Nino effect in Peru, specifically in the Pura region, probably wiped out thirty percent of the crop this year, combined with the Aki cyclone. I mean, just like those are things that people, the end consumer, doesn't think about. You know, the, no. the expectation is there's always produce on the shelf, and um, I think as people educate themselves more and more around the global happenings around all the different geopolitical factors, how the dollar exchange uh, factors into decisions with growers, how ocean freight rates you know, challenge people's position on where they should go, when they should go. Those are all factors that we in the industry get to think about. And the <laughs> get consumer to doesn't have to. So uh, enjoy no, your and vegetables, folks. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Today's uh crisis is uh tomorrow's uh inconvenience you know, yeah. all these factors. the unpredictability of, of mother nature and supply chain is something that keeps me up at night often <laughs> I bet. Yeah. well thank you for staying up at night and worrying so we don't have to we can just show up and find your delicious nutritious fruits at the grocery store and congrats on your success 20-year career uh, and I'd love to talk about what you think you can attribute that success to. I saw one of your posts on your LinkedIn profile, probably maybe right about your 20th anniversary or something, and you talked yeah. about the people and the relationships was the most important thing to you. I'm probably badly paraphrasing. No, that. it's definitely true. And that that is that's why you're successful. Whether or not my kids would always agree with this, I try and be very approachable and <laughs> I seem to be pretty good at finding common ground with most people. And uh, that's been very beneficial in my career. You know, I, my style is probably more laid back than most people. Um, but if you really got to know how I like to interact in the business space, the last thing I really talk about is produce. I'm a management <laughs> major is what my, my major was in college. But the fact is I was one credit short of a sociology minor and one credit short of an anthropology minor. And I also liked uh, psychology. And the re so the reason I bring this up is I just find, you know, different cultures, people, relationships fascinating. And that's why I love this industry, because everybody's different. Every situation is different. And it's allowed me to travel to places in this world that there's no way I would have ever gone to without being in the produce industry experiencing the things that I have, building the relationships that I've been able to, and also just uh, being able to impart some of the knowledge that I gain from all of these different people in our industry along the way. And so it's, it's pretty cool. We have a great customer over in Michigan, and he and I laugh all the time because we'll talk for 25 minutes, and then I'll say, well, what, what do we need to accomplish this week again? You know, because we're talking about <laughs> yeah. barbecue and yeah. everything under the sun, but grapes. But um, it's just, you know, I love being that way. I love talking to people, building relationships, and, yeah. uh, and that's kind of the fun part about this industry. The cool thing about 
being able to lead the team that I get to is I'm very, very clear with anybody who interacts with our team. Every person on our team carries equal weight. And I don't think that's that common in business. I fully trust everybody that works with and for me. Um, and so because of that, I respect everybody equally. I don't like them all the same, uh, but I respect them all the same. And uh, it's just kind of the way that, that I am. I've always really appreciated when people give me, you know, respect and listen and, and even if they have a differing opinion, you know, care to listen and interact and help each other to a solution. And so that's typically right. how I try and manage my team the best that I can. Well, that's fantastic. Very inspiring. Well, thank you so much for all your hard work. Uh, 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 we're not uh, finished. We're not finished. We're just, <laughs> I want to, but I want to thank him here and then we'll come. Okay. To I just want to thank that's you in case so much. He like quickly darts off. Okay. Gotta go. Bye. Bye. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if, if he knew what was coming, he would hang up right hey, now. All right. I'm ready for it. Okay. So, all right. I'm coming. I, I got to take the kids to the hockey. Bye. I gotta go. so, so Andy, we have a segment on each episode called home grown. Uh, all right. Let's hear it. So this is <laughs> Teresa loves her puns. So she comes up with a pun in each episode, and it's usually in the form of a question. And we she get asked the question. We try to guess what the answer is, trying to think of the pun. But they're always bad, so you have to groan. You can't laugh. Well, can't I'm a laugh. dad, so I love a good dad joke. So I'm hoping <laughs> I, I get this. We'll see. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right, Produce Buzzers podcast fans, it's time for your favorite segment on the Produce Buzzers podcast. Yes, it's time for Home Grow. Uh, no, don't run away. Don't turn the volume down. Don't shut it off. You got to stay and be punished. Teresa, give us the home grown. Okay. Why did the grape go out with the cranberry? <laughs> okay, hold on. Give us some, okay, I'll repeat the question. Why did the grape go out with the cranberry? Okay, Cynthia, you got a guess? I don't know, because the grape was sweet. <laughs> Rick, any, any guesses? Because the cranberry was sauced? <laughs> That's that. called date rape, I think. And no. <laughs> Andy, Andy got it. I was, was going to say so they could float away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Very good. Do grapes float? They float too? Cranberries? Yeah, I guess cranberries do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Teresa, I'm not going to guess. I can't come up with this. You know, I know I was thought it was maybe you're advertising cran grape juice, but that doesn't <laughs> Okay, why did the okay? We repeat the question. I've already forgotten it. Why did the grape go out with why, the cranberry? Or the, yes, okay. yes. Why did the grape go out with the cranberry? Because he couldn't find a date, and he heard she was a little tart. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, Christmas. <laughs> Oh, oh brother, okay. <laughs> that was actually one of your better ones, but yeah, still, that was better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Deserve, still deserve a big groan. Okay, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you again, Andy, for taking so much time. We went a little over, but I hope it didn't impact your day. The pleasure was mine. I wish you the very best of luck on your podcast, and I'll be I'll be tuning in to hear future episodes. Okay, all right, right. very good. Thank you. Okay, and thank Andy. you. All of you. No, okay, well, good luck, and uh, and once Wait. again, thank you. Hope to have you back. Bye. All right, take care. Bye. 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 <laughs> well, thank you, listeners, for tuning in to the Produce Buzzers podcast, brought to you by Produce Buzz, the gathering place for lovers of fresh fruits and veggies. We hope you were entertained a bit and educated a lot about fresh produce. Be sure to join us next time. And please tell your friends to do so as well. Like, share, and comment on our Produce Buzz Facebook page. And check out our website at www.producebuzz.com. There you will find articles about fresh fruits and veggies, how to select, store, and prepare them, as well as lots of interesting facts about all the wonderful bounty the earth provides for us. Until next time, be fruitful. And don't forget to 
Veja. Veja.